Gotta know when to roll them. Know when to hold them. Know when to make a check so you don't kill the fun. You never yeah. count your dice. When you're sitting at the table, you can add no proficiency when the check is done. Hey. Yeah. Let's talk, about, let's talk about rolling ability checks on WebDM. <laughs> All right, Jim, so, you know, we recently talked about player roles, but when do the players roll? <laughs> Since now we're talking about... <laughs> Go back to skills. It was an odd segue. Yes, when to roll. Back. We're talking about that portion of using skills and abilities uh, in, in 5th edition D&D that we kind of covered in the intro episode to it. We're just like going through the rule book. What, is, what does it actually say about making ability checks and using skill proficiencies? Mm -hmm. There's a portion of that, uh, and, and you can sort of see it on page six of the player's handbook where it outlines how to play, that they kind of breeze over. Just like, eh, DM determines what to roll and what it means, and then skips over what really could fill an entire chapter of one of these books in just a quick paragraph, they skip over it. Like the, the things that a DM would consider before asking for a role, it creates a lot of ambiguity and tension and just uncertainty across the various games uh, that at least I've played in. It's not just like idiosyncrasies between different DMs, like how they run the game, but also just like see people not using the systems that the, the fifth edition provides for them, but also like, not actually considering what it is that they're doing and how they're interacting with the rules. And so it leads to weird outcomes. The classic example yeah. of this would be the strong uh, character who can't break down a door because they just keep rolling low on their check. And it, it creates a frustrating situation because someone's like, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be super strong. I'm supposed to be the tough one. Why can't I break down this door? To me, it's less, that's less of a problem of like the rules and more of a problem of how the rules are applied. And so I'd love to talk today about that, really just this very, zoom in on this really tiny aspect of the rules where it's like, when do you determine as a dungeon master, uh, when to call for an ability check, what uh, skill proficiencies to use for it, and like the things that you ought to consider when calling for that check, because considering them will make for a richer game experience. So we're gonna get super yeah. technical, I think. <laughs> yeah, let's let, let, let's get technical because a lot of times, um, you know, sometimes players will just like make the call themselves, right? Yeah, you got to You got to counterbalance that, right? Yeah, I, I, this is something that is has started to really get under my skin in the games I play, whether as a DM or player, because the players jumping the gun at that point and, and also like interacting with the rules in a way that as a player or a DM throws me out of the game. Like, wait a minute, don't even, what are we talking about skills over here? Tell me what you do, right? Like, tell me what it is mm -hmm. you want to do. Describe it from an in-game or in-world perspective. As a dungeon master, I will then interpret that and see, first off, you might not need to roll or you might not need to roll because it's not a viable action, right? Like there's so many yeah. different things that you'd, that you'd want to consider that we sort of touched on. There are things like the viability of the action. How much time does it take? Uh, what's the difficulty class uh, that you're going to assign? What does it mean if they fail? Um, is there a way in which they can auto succeed or auto fail? Is it possible for them to retry? Is this a group check or an individual check? A lot of things that you might need to consider depending on what it is that the players want to do. And if the players are just going, I do this, clack, 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 here's my roll, then there's a pressure on the DM to just go, okay, you know, that's fine. Um, whereas I really think it's appropriate for the dungeon master in that situation to go, why did you roll that? Like, what, <laughs> what are you talking about perception or investigation? Like, those aren't things that your character knows. Like, you're, you're, you know, it's, it's a very mechanistic way of approaching the game. And even though it's like player initiative, and I normally don't like to put a, you know, put a wet blanket on things when the players take the initiative and, you know, engage with the game like that. But in this particular yeah, yeah. instance, I really do think it's like you're jumping the gun player because you don't even know what's going to happen if you fail that role. And if the DM takes that, you know, takes the role and accepts it and you failed, then it, you might not have wanted to make that role in the first place had you known mm -hmm. what the consequences of that failure would be. So uh, well, that's why. Yes, yeah, especially when just with some question and answer, like you said, might circumvent a role entirely because yeah. you already had the idea of searching the particular area you needed to. And instead right. of just walking through that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, back and forth with the DM, I used to be that player all the time. <laughs> all, right, all right, I'm going to make a listen check. Do I hear anything? It's like, well. Right. 
Well, and that's why something like passive skills come into play, which we'll, which we'll get to. I think sticking to the core gameplay loop of the DM uh, interprets what the player wants to do, calls for an ability check. There's some fuzziness over how skills apply to that ability check. The, the player's handbook and the DMG don't exactly align on this. Uh, it seems to be that for the most part, if the DM doesn't call for particular proficiency, the player can suggest one or even vice versa. It could be like, well, you know, I'm really not trying to do this. I'm trying to do that. Um, which is a whole separate sort of show of how to uh, how to portray your actions and communicate them to the DM uh, in a way that gets you exactly what you want and not you know avoid some uh, misunderstanding. I think that the DM led uh, way of doing ability checks is is the better way to do it in so much as there is a better way to do anything in RPGs because it gives the player more information. Like if you're asking, if you're yeah. describing your actions and then waiting for the dungeon master. To, to let you know how the rules will apply to this situation, then you can sort of see like, wait a minute, I don't, I don't want to have to make a check for this. Or is there a way that I can arrange things so that I don't need to? And that's a, to me, a more satisfying way to, to play the game. You should see the check as there's a, there's a finality to it. Uh, yeah. It doesn't necessarily have to be because like I said, we're going to kind of get to when to re-roll and things like that. Mm -hmm. But when it, when it comes to like, I'm trying to look for a thing in a room, asking about as much information in the room is the best way to do it because it's right. all just free information. To work it right up to the point where finally the, the, the dungeon master goes, okay, I've given you everything, now just go ahead and make that investigation check to see if you find the specific yeah. thing that needs to be found in this room. Yeah, um, and, and I find that, yeah. that what you're describing there is like the meat of an RPG. And yeah. so to jump straight to just a die roll cuts out so much of the game that is the back and forth. Here's what the environment is like. Okay, what about this thing over here? Can you describe it in more detail? My character goes over there and checks it out. And as a dungeon master myself, that's the first thing I'm gonna use to determine whether or not an ability check gets rolled or not. If the players describe the exact thing that they do, and I have already determined, you know, this hidden item is in this area, or this secret door is there, or this is what it will take to convince the, the noble or whatever to, to assist you, and then the players do exactly that, there's no need to roll. <laughs> it, they, it happens, you know? Yeah. And, and if I need some way to like determine whether or not uh, that happens through the game rules, like there's at least three different ways to automatically succeed on something per the rules of fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons. And so there's so many ways in which you don't even need to roll to begin with. Um, oh yeah, like what? That I think, <laughs> you know, after you've determined sort of the viability, is this thing possible at all? Which is sort of the first question to ask yourself, you know, is this automatically gonna fail uh, or is it automatically gonna succeed? Is it something so trivial that we don't need to roll at all? Page 237 of the DMG has a, has a good summary of uh, this process. The three states for like auto success are either passive checks, right? Like this, and especially in the sense of like this passive check is the floor that you can't go below, uh, which is sort of the way that the uh, Crawford sort of uh, uses the rule. I don't think everybody does. If you can take 10 times as long to, to do something and there's really no consequence for taking that long, it's an auto success, right? And then there's some variant rules in the DMG for calculating like, right, when does a high strength character actually need to roll? Or when does someone who's like proficient in something actually have to roll? Because there's sometimes where your ability is just of a certain threshold that you don't need to. There's no meaningful consequence for failure, which is the most important thing to determine when you're rolling. What is the meaningful consequence of failure? And mm -hmm. if there's not a meaningful consequence, why are you rolling in the first place? And so these are the, the auto success variant uh, in the DMG and then passive skills or, or taking 10 times as long are ways that you can sort of apply an automatic success to something within the game rules for an action that has no meaningful consequence of failure. And like, that's where I'll start off at. There's a risk inherent in rolling a die and you need to be prepared for the player failing that roll. And there are too many times what I see as a player is the DM will call for a roll and it's <laughs> the, the player just botches it, <laughs> you know, rolls a two and just can't, uh, you know, no, no amount of modifier is going to get them there. And it's clear that the DM expected them to pass that roll. And those are moments where I was like, if you expected him to pass it because you think it's like necessary to progress further in your adventure, why did you ask for a roll in the first place? I, well, I mean, I run into that problem all the time. Uh, yeah. and, it's, and to me, it's because like, I feel like I'm preserving the, the randomness of the universe. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, you, you know, you have to hunt to find this clue, but you fail to find it 
but you really need this clue. And it's kind of mm-hmm. like, well, shit. And so I, yeah. I, I've been there. But you, you yeah. it's, it, I don't know. For me, that's how I felt. I like, I, like, well, I can't just tell them. And I eventually do because it's like, well, the game needs to progress. I sure, can't just sit sure. Here staring at the floor. Uh, yeah, I mean, unless you're prepared to go, yep, you don't know that. You're like, where are you going to go? And there are times where that's appropriate. Like, there are times where, yeah, you didn't pass. So that avenue of inquiry, that avenue of approach is no longer available to you. And, you know, as a dungeon master, being ready for that contingency, for the possibility that that's going to happen, is part of what uh, we're talking about today. But to get back to sort of the, the considerations that a DM would make, so there's, is the action viable? Uh, is this something that's an auto success or auto failure? Auto failures would be like, I don't care what you rolled on your persuasion check. This guy or this person is not going to give you that. They're not going to do what they want because it is completely un- unreasonable or outside the realm of possibility for what they will do. The sort of assumption that a high roll will get you whatever it is that you're asking for. Where it's like, I don't care what you rolled on your athletics. You're not going to jump 60 feet. <laughs> like, it just, is that your, do you have that speed? Is that what you're, you know, uh, mm-hmm. it's just not possible. And there's a lot of things like that where you'll see players attempt to succeed on something um, that is just clearly not, not going to work. But they'll insist that they can because of that randomness factor, right? And a lot of times it comes with an, uh, the assumption that a 20 is a crit and automatically succeeds on anything, which is insane. I mean, there's a 5% chance that whatever you do that is nearly impossible succeeds. Forget, get out of here. Like, <laughs> a 5% chance to do anything isn't something that is nearly impossible. Right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> there, there, should be no, there should be no percentage chance of auto success yeah. on something nearly impossible. And I, that's why I don't use 20s and 1s for anything other than attacks, because like combat, there's so many variables, it makes sense, right? There's mm-hmm. so many things at play that having a 5% chance to utterly fail or a 5% chance to critically succeed is feels appropriate. Um, but not for ability checks, not for saves. So that kind of brings us to the question of like difficulty class, because that's another thing that you're gonna mm-hmm. wanna determine as a dungeon master. Thinking about the DC, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? How difficult is something? How, how much do you want someone to succeed? What's the probability that you want them to succeed? There's a really fine art to it, I think, that really just comes with practice and, and looking yeah. at the DCs and sort of knowing what numbers characters have at different levels. Easy task is still DC 10, which is like, without any modifier, that's a 50-50 shot, <laughs> you know, or yeah, like 55 yeah. or whatever, um, to actually pass and there's sometimes or even at 20th level the only thing only modifier a player is getting for a role is maybe plus one or plus two you know so even like for high level characters a dc 10 can be an insurmountable obstacle that's why i think internalizing that table of of 5 10 up to 30 uh, in five uh you know five digit increments is really important because that's the bread and butter of fifth edition if you know if you don't know anything else knowing what the DCs are is going to get you through as a, a dungeon master. Because you can always go, all right, I don't know, but make this check DC 15. This is a crazy, wacky idea that you've come up with. And I'll be able to muddle my way through this situation. I mean, even just your point about the difficulty class and like it being a 50-50 to do this kind of shows you why a role isn't always called for. Unless there's a consequence or a, a, a failure or something like that, should there be a 50-50 chance on running up these stairs with an athletics check? Like, what's the reason that you would need to make a check going up? You know, is it slippery? Is, it, is there rain? Is there combat? You know, like, that's, that's when it becomes a, a necessity to roll when otherwise you shouldn't. And uh, to kind of keep DMs from, I was guilty of that early on in my DM days. Because I wanted to feel like, you know, we're playing a game, so I was always calling for rolls when I realized half the time I was like, eh, they didn't really need to roll for that. I thought that that was how the game was played. Sure, yeah, you and how, that's how a lot of the game is played for a lot of people. I have, I've got maybe a potentially a spicy take. Uh, we'll see how Uh-oh. people react to it. Uh-oh, get, get your milk ready. I, you know, if you're, if you're rolling dice, that's not playing the game. And I think a lot of people substitute die rolling for playing the game. They think they're playing the game when they're rolling dice. But the game is the description and the back and forth, the question and answer, making decisions. And then once that point is reached, once we've decided, all right, this is what you're doing. All right. Well, is it auto success, auto failure? Is this viable? Okay, it's not auto success, not auto failure. Yes, it's viable. Let's roll the die. It's only after you've made the decision and the DM determines that it's uncertain, but still viable, 
that you start rolling the dice, but that's not the game. The game is the getting to that point. This is a journey destination kind of thing, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and <laughs> this is one of the marks against a skill system, right? Like one of the arguments against right. skills is that it encourages players to only think about their character sheet and only consider the mechanical options available to them instead of like living in the world and making decisions from an in-world perspective, which to mm -hmm. me is the whole point of playing the game and produces the story that everybody likes to talk about. Uh, is in those moments. But at the same time, if your dungeon master hasn't considered what happens if you fail, which is the bigger one of, su like success is obvious, but failure is another thing entirely. And the DMG and the player's handbook are very ambiguous on what mm -hmm. exactly failure should be, what it should look like, and how to have it not completely stall your game and put a huge <laughs> downer on it while everybody sits around going, well, well shit. yeah. What do we do now? <laughs> well, hell, it sounds like we need to have a conversation about the consequences of failure, Jim Davis. Oh my God! Yes, I we mean did. these outcomes, these uh, the, the the these rolls that we make. It's all sunshine and rainbows until that one comes up and you slip while climbing the rope um, <clears throat> and fall. Meaningful consequences of failure and uncertain outcomes are the two things that I look at here. And looking to the rule book, uh, sort of to see what it is that the guidance that they offer. There's a couple of things that we find in the section on using ability scores in the PHB, it's pretty clear that failure either means no progress towards your goal or progress with a complication. I'm unsatisfied with that. <laughs> it leaves no room for failure and setback. Not just no progress, but like I made things worse for myself and I didn't progress. And I know that it tilts things in favor of like the game moving forward, of, of it not completely stalling out, but then it also means that you're not getting those moments where the player has to deal with a, a real setback. And, and sort of yeah. like, oh man, I'm, that sucks. I was trying to do this thing and I had resources that I, that I devoted to it. And, and you know, I've got one shot at it and it didn't work. And now I gotta figure out what to do next. It's like avoiding those moments. I understand the impulse too. I understand the impulse to go like a failure. Eh, don't worry about it, it just doesn't happen. But like having something more than that Having something be like, no, not only does it not happen, but it's bad. Like this is, you know, <laughs> you, not only do you not get what you want, but you're going to get something you don't want. And yeah, Cobra, Cobra Kai does not prepare you for that inevitability. So. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Sorry. The DMG doesn't really go into a lot of it. It gives you some advice for resolution uh, on page 242, where it's kind of like, all right, you know, a lot of times the the game rules will tell you what happens on a failure or a uh, you know or a success things like all right uh, somebody cast fireball on me failure means i take this much damage succeeding means i take that much you know it's very clear cut right there in the rules um same with like attacks other things like that but skill checks or sorry ability checks uh, and skills are one of those things where there's not a lot of guidance and and prior editions of D&D have answered those questions. Uh, you know, first edition DMG, oh, I failed my climb walls. Well, that occurs at the midway point. You're not gonna take, you know, it's not gonna occur at the 90% point. You're gonna take all of that but one die of damage for falling. It was like half. And similarly with like third edition, there was guidelines and guidance for what it means when these, uh, the use of these skills, you know, it doesn't go the way the player wants. And I find fifth edition is one of those where they're headed in the right direction. And they, mm -hmm. the advice they give isn't, useless it's good you know they'll, they they you know consequences with with uh, or failure with consequences have it be something that that complicates the player's life not just completely ruins it that kind of thing but then it doesn't actually give you the tools necessary or like solid examples to apply that to your own game and this is a skill that i think as a dungeon master you just gotta think <laughs> you just really need to just think and even if it means time you know calling a timeout for the game and just going like let's sit for a minute the the task you are attempting to succeed at this is pretty consequential and it's going to require us to give it some thought before you roll the die just so that the player knows what's going to happen if they fail and i find that those mm -hmm. dms who are like up front with it just they're pu talking purely metagame terms that i enjoy those games more because they'll tell me, all right, if you, this before you roll, this is what's at stake. If you botch this roll, not only will it mean you don't convince, uh, you know, the Duke to lend their support in your claim to the throne, it's bad. <laughs> like they they will not only do that, but they will take it as an offense and back the other person against you, right? Even if you mm -hmm. just fail, uh, this is how precarious it is. 
this part, the, what does it mean when the players fail, I think really deserves a lot of thought and is one of those things that as you're learning to DM, as you're, as you're growing as a DM, that you spend a lot of time on because you can really stall a game. You can really deflate a player's motivation. You can really just really cause all of it to grind, come to a grinding halt by not really considering what it is that failure means. Taking those moments to actually think about it uh, is, is a great like tension building moment. It's mm. the cliffhanger, we'll be right back after these messages. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just give me a second. <laughs> Maybe that player will think, think twice about it next time, like, well, shit, hang on. Yeah, you know. exactly. They might, they might. And this is one of those things where I think it's appropriate not only to call a timeout, but like to solicit information from the players. Not only does the buck stop with the DM in terms of like who makes the final call about a role, but you can still like talk to the players. All right, what might this mean? What are you really trying to accomplish? Uh, so that it gives you a, a bit of insight into what they consider at stake in the situation. And then once you've gotten that, you can make a call, you can sort of talk it through mm -hmm. and sort of work it out ahead of time, especially if it's something that's like really important and, and not just like, do I jump over this thing? Do I pick this lock? Do I whatever that represents a major turning point in the session, or mm -hmm. it's the culmination of a bunch of events and like you're rolling the die to see whether like how the direction of the campaign is going to go from here on out <laughs> you know there's some times yeah. where a single die roll does uh does change the course of a campaign yeah it's like in uh like in Baldur's gate you can pick the lock but as long as you don't take the stuff the guards don't get called you know <laughs> <laughs> but this is also something that, that that as players and dms play together they'll start to pick up on those cues like the yeah. way a dm will ask a question you know can start like mm. informing players oh shit you know, oh, shit. he, he yeah. used his inside DM voice. Like, are you, are you sure you want to do that? <laughs> are you sure you want to do that? Or tell me exactly how you do this. That, <laughs> yeah. That's my favorite one is, is not just like, you know, cause I'll hear a player go like, well, I searched the thing. All right, hold up. What exactly do you do? This is what it looks like. This is where you're at in the world. This is, you know, uh, mm -hmm. what do you do? What does that look like? Because that's going to inform a lot of what what happens next. And not only does that inform the deliberative process for myself, whether or not they need to check, but it's also like, it will inform what the consequences of that failure are. If, if mm -hmm. it does necessitate a check, because maybe it's like, all right, I'm searching a room for something, trying to toss a room, trying to get as much clues as possible. But there are things in that room that if you interact with them might be dangerous or might have consequences of themselves. I touched this crystal. Well, the crystal had something in it. <laughs> you didn't know that both projecting the potential uh, consequences of failure, either through in-game, kind of like, well, this chasm's really deep and you can smell the rot of, of meat from the people that have tried to cross in the past. There's flies everywhere. Like, that's one way of, of projecting that, uh, the threat. And then the other is just to be like, yeah, if you don't pass this, you're going to take like 12 D6 damage, you know, uh, and, and it's going to be bad. You're also going to have to like try to find a way out of this pit. Um, yeah. That, <laughs> that that's why this is a skill worth cultivating. A lot of times you'll see something called fail forward, uh, especially in regards to like TPKs and things like that. And fail forward is just another one of those like success with a complication uh, kind of things. I think it's good if used sparingly. Um, but as a player, mm -hmm. I find if I get too many success at a cost or yeah, you, you know, you passed anyway, or, or the worst is like, yeah, I really botched that role. Eh, never mind, you passed anyway. Those are the <laughs> those are the moments where I'm like, no, I want to fail. I failed this yeah. role. Please tell me what happens. Yeah. So for DMs, I, I think it's worth going through, uh, you know, if you really want to develop this, worth going through the using ability section in the PHP and the DMG and consider like, what are the consequences of failing an athletics check? for the various things it says you could use an athletics check for. What are the consequences of failing, um, you know, a stealth roll in a way that isn't just like, oh, they spot you, but maybe it's like they detect your presence and now know something about you <laughs> and it's given them time to prepare uh, or something like that. Um, the charisma based skills are, are good for this because there's so much that could go on in a social interaction with an NPC. So you could say like maybe a failure on deception, not just like, oh, I caught you, you know, you, you didn't succeed in, in deceiving them, but like, they know you tried to lie to them. And that's yeah. going to make things very bad for you, depending on who they are and what you want. Um, that I find like, those are the sorts of things. And there's no hard and fast rule. There's no, like, you should do this if what the failure is, it's just one of those things that you have to develop an instinct for. 
and and just play through play the game a lot and and pay a special attention to that moment of all right what happens i'm about to call for a roll what happens if they fail so I give, I give you an example of this from one of my own games. <clears throat> first session of Land Between Two Rivers. I have an enemy who is in the first sort of scene with the players. They don't know this. The enemy is disguised. And I give them four opportunities to notice that there's someone noticing them and paying special attention to them. And every time they botch it. Like, I've never seen a group of roles just, like, completely... Um, just completely changed the way I thought something would go. But I also was prepared for this. You know, I was like, oh, they're probably going to succeed. They're, I'm going to call for a lot because there's going to be moments where it's appropriate. Um, and I'm, I'm actively calling for them instead of using passive perception because these are just the context of the situation uh, calls for it. They didn't pass any of them. And mm -hmm. so what that meant was that they had no idea that for the first dozen or so sessions that they were being observed and watched by someone in their midst, that whenever they were walking around town or doing something, you know, they, they lived in a certain place, that someone was always watching them and keeping tabs on them and just seeing what they do. So when that enemy did decide to strike, it came out of nowhere. And they were like, what? <laughs> Who is this person? What is going on? How did they get in our house, right? How do they know exactly where to go to escape us? And to me, it's one of those things where I feel like after that event has happened, it's okay to go, yeah, you guys just, they've been here all along and you just have never, you know, you haven't passed any of the roles that I called for, or you haven't done something which would otherwise put you in a position to, to notice them. And I found that that was a really satisfying experience. And it seemed it was a satisfying experience for the players because that temporary setback, then they got their revenge. Everybody had a good time. If I just tell them this information, despite the fact that they failed the roles, I'm putting my thumb on the scales of what yeah. the game has told us the outcome is. Because as our friends at Encounter RP like to remind us, the dice do tell a story. And mm -hmm. sometimes that, that narrative is, you fucked up. You, you don't get it. <laughs> you do not succeed. And that yeah, is yeah. interesting. Success is boring a lot of the times. It's, it's when you fail and have to recover from that that I find are interesting moments in a game. Being baptized in fire and, and coming out the other side stronger, that's, those are the moments. Uh, and in order to do that, you have to fail. Uh, yeah, you have to Not fail. all the time, but most of the time. Failure forces you to rethink. It yes. forces you yeah. to think of a way to, because uh, there are ways to try roles again, but come at it from a different angle, a different perspective. Talk to your party members. Does, I mean, you know, did, they, did somebody not give you guidance last time? Clerics, come on. Always be there with guidance. Come on. Come on. Uh, guidance. <laughs> come on now. It's free. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, and it's another thing where it's like, all right, if it's, if it's not combat and multiple people aren't trying to do it and you've got someone with guidance, I do think it's appropriate to go like, all right, cleric, you, um, we're assuming that every time someone attempts to do something in your yeah, present, yeah. you're casting guidance on them. All right, yes. So the cleric, it's sort of <laughs> yeah, like the rogue checking for traps. I would have been checking for traps. I would have cast guidance on them. All right, well, we can assume you did that. Like, that's a reasonable assumption. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cleric's always there with parables from their text. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, oh, God, oh, you, but you're right. Oh, God, yeah, yeah, I get it. With all these, these consequences a uh, possibility, it might be in the be player's best interest to not roll. So yes. what are some ways where you, we can circumvent the need for a role? So the, the way to do this, um, and, and we kind of mentioned it at the top of the show uh, a bit, but there are three ways to, um, to ensure sort of success without having to roll. And the player's handbook lists the primary one of those, which is passive checks. And passive checks, which it does not limit to passive perception. It, when you know the player's handbook section on it uh, assumes that anything could be a passive check because anything that you do repeatedly over an extended period of time, that's what the passive check represents. So passive perception is the, the most common one because it's you're constantly perceiving your environment, right? Mm -hmm. It makes sense that there is a, a threshold which you will just sort of spot things. The important thing for me the, that I recognize as a DM is this is not radar and it still takes effort, right? It still takes an, you know, players or, or sorry, characters who are on the lookout, being aware, being attentive, 
Um, it's not something that just happens. They're not, you know, you can't just like, oh, I, you know, something's w within my passive perception radius and I know exactly where they are now. It's not really how it works. You're trying to do something, you're actively engaged in something over a period of time. And if you are, mm -hmm. say, in a dungeon and it's a dangerous environment and you're progressing slowly and you're on the lookout for danger, that's the kind of situation that passive perception is going to be really useful in. Otherwise, I might just disadvantage on it. You're not, you're not paying attention. Disadvantage. Minus five to your passive perception. To me, I think that even someone who's very perceptive can fail sometimes. Yeah. Uh, and, and it goes beyond just the thing failing or getting, like, being really stealthy. So what um, you're talking about is you'd have them roll perception then. Like uh, there are certain certain examples or certain periods where yes, I would have them yeah. actually roll perception. If they're in a dungeon and they maybe know that there's something out there, so they're looking specifically for something. Because that yeah. goes beyond just paying attention to your peripherals. Once you're actually right. focused on something, your peripheral uh, awareness goes away because you're yeah. focused. And so therefore there is a chance to fail if you're actively like, no, 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 I'm trying to find this thing specifically. Yeah. Okay, well now you get to roll for it and you might roll right. shitty. And yes. uh, whereas before you just kind of have your, like you said, it's not radar, but it is, you know, it is the, the combination of your awareness. You, you, you know, how does the air hit your, hit, hit your face differently, you know, and did you hear a sound over there and, and see a twinkle in the light, uh, yeah. you know, things like that. But you have to, mm -hmm. you know, that's a thing, that, that's a mentality that is separate from specifically looking for something. I look at the perception check in those instances as being, do you perceive it before it can act on you? Like, it's not like, mm -hmm. do you perceive it? I perceived it, but it got the drop on me. So I'll see, yeah. like, um, you know, no matter, you know, I've got observant, I've got, you know, a bunch of feet, my, my passive perceptions in, in you know, ridiculously high. Um, yeah. But in this instance, it's not about whether I perceive it is, do I perceive it in time to act? That's the question. That is why we are rolling in that instance. It's not whether you perceive it or not, but do you perceive it so that you can act before it can act for you? And this is different than initiative, right? Initiative is I already know they're here we're going to attack, you know, but this is how say surprise is established, right? If you didn't perceive it before, you know, it was a threat, then you can't act in the first round of combat, but it could also be something like a trap, right? Like, oh, I didn't perceive mm -hmm. that until it was too late until I was already, I had already set it off. I'd already heard the click of the press pressure plate or the, you know, the glow of a spell glyph as it's about to go off. It can create moments of of dissonance between what the player thinks their character's capable of and what the dice tell them. But again, that's a reason of like, if you've called for the role, then there is uncertainty. This is not yeah. a guaranteed thing. The idea that my character, you know, this isn't uncertain for them. Well, that was something to negotiate with the DM before the die were, the dice were rolled. It's possible that the dungeon master didn't understand what you were trying to do. It is a fun, fuzzy area, but that's why we have a lot of tools for determining what happens when the players attempt something. That's a lot about passive perception. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Any skill can be made passive. Any, like, are you yeah. attempting to cross, uh, you know, a stretch of wilderness, uh, you know, and you don't want to play through every single moment of that <laughs> journey. You just want to give a summary of what happens. All right, what's your passive survival? You know, okay, I'm attempting to research a topic. Uh, I, I, you know, I found a library or a house of lore or something like that. And, you know, I want to learn more about this one piece of information. All right, what's your passive investigation? Right, like what, what you know, how, <laughs> how long can you keep this up? Or how long does it take you to find this information? You will find it. It's just a matter of how yeah. long it takes you. I find that those things are, 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 passive checks are good for those types of situations. And then there's the obvious one of like, passive checks are great when you don't want to alert the players that something's going on. You know, you just mm -hmm. keep note of what their stats are, what their checks are, uh, their check modifiers are, quietly check it yourself so that then you can describe the environment without taking them out of the moment or tipping them off that something's wrong. <laughs> the classic, I didn't, I, my, does my character know they rolled really low? <laughs> like, are they yeah. aware of how bad they just did? Maybe not, but like as a player, you know, and it's hard to not act on that information. And it's hard for the other players not to act on it as well. This would be the, the classic skill dog pile of like, Oh, they yeah. failed this well, role. I'll, I'm going to try. I'm going to try, <laughs> yeah, try, try Well, I'll try. Well, I'll try. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. You could extend that even uh, to go back to the really strong character who can't open the door. A passive athletics, I mean, if you got an 18 strength and you have proficiency, you got a plus six there, 
So your passive score is 16. So maybe like if the DC to open a door is below that, well, I mean, you open it. Like that's, you, yeah. you don't need to roll. Uh, yeah. And so that could be a way to, to look at that even. And the DMG provides for that, interestingly enough. Yeah. The auto yeah. success variant there has two ways uh, of applying it. One of them is you take uh, the character's score, their ability score and subtract five. And that is the DC that they beat, right? I got a strength of 20. That means I'm gonna open any door with a DC of 15 or lower. I just will, don't need to roll. The other method is to take, uh, consider if they have proficiency, and then if they have proficiency and it's DC 10 or lower, they automatically pass. And if they're 11th level or higher, that increases the DC 15 that they automatically mm. pass. That's the one I use most often. And oh, the, yeah. the, the one that I use most often is, do you have proficiency in that? Yep, then you don't need to, you just know it. You just can, you just do it. This is routine for you, difficult for someone without the proficiency. Because remember, right. ability scores already represent your skills. They're not just your innate talents, but they also represent what training you have and the skills that those things uh, represent. And then your skill proficiency is a specialization in a particular aspect of what that ability score is. So proficiency represents something that you've specifically trained for, whereas like anyone can attempt the thing within reason um, without the proficiency those with proficiency are better at it you don't need to roll that is um, a handy tool that i'm not sure i've ever seen used when i'm a player um, that but that i like to use a lot whenever i'm dungeon mastering it's a frequent source of friction between players and dms i've seen a lot from both sides of the screen where you know a disagreement between what the dm calls for and what the player thinks should happen occurs over whether or not they should have to roll or how difficult the role is, or, or, or something like that, or what it means to fail. And so we're talking about this because this is something I think DMs really need to think about. This is the heart and soul of dungeon mastering right here. It's, if you learn nothing else about playing fifth edition, mastering this part of it, when to roll, what it means to roll, and how to convey that information to the player is, that's like GMing 101, <laughs> you know? And so returning to this and really digging into it and sort of exploring its various facets is important because it is so vital to dungeon mastering. Because what you're looking to avoid is uh, <laughs> defined by a fancy term that uh, you may or may not have heard before called Ludo narrative dissonance. And that's a um, video game term of where a uh, video game, the mechanics of a video game contradict the narrative that the story of the game is trying to tell you, right? Uh, I'm a plucky, okay. you know, explorer or something like that who murders their way through countless faceless mooks. One of the criticisms of, say, the Uncharted series is the uh, <laughs> the amount of violence that goes on in it. Well, and yeah. <laughs> sure. It's one of those things that I've seen, a term that I've seen applied to RPGs for this similar situation of like, wait a minute, I'm strong, I'm smart, I'm fast, I'm perceptive or whatever. This die roll, especially given the trivialness of this particular thing I'm trying to do, doesn't mesh with my conception of the character, my conception of the world, the kind of game we're going for. Maybe it completely stalls the game out. It's gonna take me as a player out of the moment. And it might take me out of the moment as a DM. And so knowing that that can happen and knowing that, that for a lot of players, a lot of participants of the game, that like that is a state that they want to avoid. They don't want to be taken out of this experience. They don't want to have to scratch their head and go like, what does that mean? How does this work? Like, what, what, this, is, this seems weird that the weakling sorcerer was able to bash down something that the barbarian couldn't or the bumbling fighter was able to sneak past someone that, uh, you know, that the ranger couldn't. Unless it's like really, really, really meaningful in those situations, just giving the player who's good at, who created a character that is good at something, the chance to be good at it mm -hmm. is more important than maybe they fail and it doesn't matter if they fail because it doesn't, nothing's really going to happen. But for that player, you have taken away something uh, from them. You've, you've said like, yeah, it doesn't matter what your character concept was. It doesn't matter how many points you've sunk into something, choices you've made about your character, how you've built them. The dice in this situation negate your stake in the game. And yeah. they don't do it for any anything other than to negate it. It's not that it's meaningful. There's nothing interesting that's going to happen from that. It's just, nope, you don't. And I've seen so many players in that situation just deflated and taken right out of the game because of something that the dice said that they disagreed with and it was inconsequential. And that's not something we need to have happen because the DM gets to determine when that die roll happens in the first place. <laughs> yeah, that's, and you can only use the jar of pickles joke so many times for the door thing. Like, well, you loosened it for me. 
Yeah, sure. Uh, sure. The jar, like the but what's a fail for with the jar of pickles? Like I open it, but it cracks and breaks and pickle juice all over you. And you didn't know this, but those goblins love pickles. Oh man, <laughs> they go into a pickle rage. They go into a pickle rage. If you like the video, please like, subscribe, and go ahead and ring that bell to get those notifications. The Web DM exists thanks to our Patreon patrons, the, the Web, Web Demons. Demons. If you join the Web Demons, you'll get our weekly podcast, show audio, discounts that'll save you way more than $5 a month on books and dice, and so much more. Check out our free podcast episodes right now, including our free interview with Luke Gygax about all things D&D. If you like our advice for your games, then why don't you come check us out and watch us play? Yeah, head on over to our second YouTube channel, WebDM Plays, and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Alrighty. Hey, Trav, wake up.